Director of the Francis McClellan Institute. The Francis McClellan Institute is dedicated to honoring um, the legacy of Francis McClellan. And our goal is to improve the lives of children, youth, and families. And to do this through developing and promoting high quality research that can be brought to bear on issues of importance. So you can find out more information. Kind of goes in and out. Okay. So you can find more information about us at our website here for the McClellan Institute. And make sure you friend us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. All kinds of great updates. I want to make sure to thank Pamela Turboville uh, for the speaker series. She provided an endowment to Family and Consumer Sciences in 2000 that helps support this speaker series and also supports uh, research and teaching. Pamela is a University of Arizona alumni from Family and Consumer Sciences. She's also the recipient of the Cal's Alumni Achievement Award in 2000. So today, can you hear this? Is that helping? <laughs> okay, the last lecture is a tradition within academia that when faculty retire, they do one final lecture. This is different than our normal lectures. It's an opportunity for faculty to tell us about their personal and their professional journey. And so today we're very lucky that Dr. Maureen Kelly is going to talk to us about her 32 years of teaching and research here at the University of Arizona. And in this last lecture, she's going to answer the question, what would you say if this was your last lecture? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a couple things about Maureen, because she doesn't always toot her own horn, but she's done a lot of fantastic things. And I can see, even as people are walking in today, uh, the kind of happiness and connection she's made with former students, with faculty. She has a big impact on many people. So Maureen has a PhD from Ohio State University. And that is in, is that right? And that was in comprehensive vocational education. And she has a master's in home economic administration from the University of Massachusetts. She's actually received several awards here at the University of Arizona. In particular, she's received some outstanding teacher awards from the Career and Technical Education Association in 2008 and from the JTED Founders Award from the Pima County. Maureen is a very dedicated teacher, and our students have been very lucky and very well served by her time and her dedication to mentorship with the Family and Consumer Sciences Education Lab. Is that right? Well, no, just the education program. So I just want to add a little personal note. I actually met Maureen when I came here in the year 2000. I met her through the Association for Women Faculty. This is an association that was developed in order to monitor the status of faculty women on campus and to challenge issues about salary equity. At that time, Maureen was president of the AWF from 2001 to 2003. So I had a great role 
wall to see her in front of all these other women and in front of the administrators truly challenging and pushing for these issues of equity and inclusivity. One memory I have in particular is when I became president for AWF in 2008, and I held a meeting with other female faculty, and Maureen was there, and we were talking about preparing for a meeting with President Shelton, and we were talking about issues of salary equity. And I had just had my firstborn child, so I was there at the meeting, holding my kid, trying to give him a bottle, and the meaning of the personal is political really became alive for me in that moment with all these other female faculty who were supportive and providing mentorship. And so I want to thank Maureen for her support, her mentorship for me, and for other people. And it is my honor today to introduce her last lecture.
but they've been replaced by the 11 million immigrants who've come in who are in our same age group. So we're still at the 76 uh, million. Um, of course, we grew up post-war, and we grew up in an age of entitlement where uh, we were seeing people developing uh, nuclear families, coming back from war, going through education. Um, and as we grew up, we were profoundly affected by things like, one is, what were we most affected by? There's actually three listed here, but that could be many more. I mean, what was the, every, we say 9-11 was the landmark moment in the lives of millennials. What, were the, what was the landmark experience for baby boomers? They were actually hey. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. What did you JFK assassinations, yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. Yes, that was another one. Uh, Watergate. What's and stop? Civil rights. <laughs> Somebody said something else. He said Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, not really, but the sexual revolution is often listed there as well, and certainly civil rights riots. So we're a generation that always liked to work from our strengths, did a lot, learned how to do a lot of consensus building, our mentors, uh, and wanted to see change affected in our lifetime. And we worked very hard to see a lot of change happen, certainly the civil rights, women's movement, uh, a variety of things moved in a direction that showed that we were experiencing some progress. And how did technology come to us? Yeah, Apple TVs came to us. That was our technology. You have to use it. That was. So we we actually grew up when computers were large. Took. Uh, the state took up the space of a large room and had to be very carefully cooled. And you couldn't actually touch them and interact with them unless you were somebody who was in charge of them and was allowed into the secret compartments. We never had that access to computers. And then there is this Generation X, or we call them Gen Xers, that uh, occupied the time or were born during uh, the 60s, 65, and there's various consensuses on whether or not uh, that Gen X ended, period ended in 80 or 82. And there's 46 million of you. How many people fall into that Gen X category? <laughs> A small group. A small group. But an important group. 46 million. And your landmark uh, moments were different in that you grew up in a in a a period of financial, social, and family insecurity. Lots more divorce. Um, lots more changing financial times, um, and so you were very good at at coming to the workplace and coming to families and not trusting anybody except yourself. <laughs> and, uh, which we always said, the boomer said, don't trust anybody over 30. And then we got there and we said, <laughs> So uh, this particular group, very good about practical problem solving. Very tech they are technically competent because they learned in their young adulthood generally about technology and, and worked within it. And they're very comfortable with diversity, change, they're very good at multitasking, and they like to compete. Um, this is, the Gen Xers are the most diverse generation uh, in American history. And they believe that similarities rather than differences should be emphasized, because that's what they know. And then there are the millennials. Uh, millennials, generally 1979 to 1994, and I know I have lots of those in there. How many of you are millennials? Yeah, I know that. A lot of millennials. Okay. Um, yeah, I know. It's a matter of, I think it's who you identify with and what you're more like than, you, uh, than the year that you were born, because it's clearly your critical experiences that you have. But Gen Xers, don't like anything the way it is and are about to change it. They want higher salaries. In fact, they would like to be living in the same way that their parents as adults 
middle age were um, when they perhaps went to home. They are now uh, one to have that in their 20s. They also want flexible work arrangements. They want to have more financial leverage. They want to be able to use money here, use money here, leverage some money here to do this. And of course, they're, develop, they're living in an age of credit. Um, but the important thing for them is that they were born into a wider world. They've never known anything except uh, having technology around them. Uh, from the very moment that I encounter technology, no, not the very moment, but early on in my experience, I always had to have my daughter, Colleen, guide me because she would know more than I would know. Um, but I did get there first. <laughs> I do remember her waking up, though, um, one of the first mornings we had her at home, and I was starting up the computer, and you know when it used to make those noises? It would go, <laughs> and I didn't hear it. And she looked up, like, oh, that's what I've been hearing. This is part of my environment. Um, so millennials are connected 24 hours a day, um, but they have seen over their lifetime, they've seen their parents lose their job, they've seen companies downsize, they've seen uh, a variety of things that they thought were promised to, to parents generally, uh, and see that people weren't honest, that that didn't really happen. So they are they have a, a degree of distrust, especially of institutions. I think it was the baby boomer influence too. But they voice their opinions and they have a tremendous appetite for work. They're very energetic. Um, but this is the first generation since the boomers that is also socially active, probably brought about by social technology. But they can exchange ideas. They know how to look online and many of them find ideas that are important and find information that uh, supports that idea, evaluate that information, and then decide to act. So if we can think about each of these three groups and the different ways we've experienced technology, um, let's think about for just a minute what kind of technology have we experienced over the time that technology has been in our lives. Now give me a little hint because I found this one. <laughs> uh, which actually comes from our distance education project. When I came here from the University of Wisconsin, I was horrified that you had to drive places to provide education. Joyce! Oh! <laughs> 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 um, I couldn't believe that everybody had come to a central location to learn, so I started out this uh, project that um, to look at how can we deliver education uh, in service education, uh, professional development education via various media. And at the time, the choices were uh, uh, video, and look at the size of that video. Remember that, Amy G? And I, left it, I inherited that from you and Doris. <laughs> uh, and I think you probably remember those Apple IIEs. Carol, you were in there for weren't you? And I was, when I first saw Joyce, I looked through some pictures the other day, uh, preparing for this, and I saw you. I had a picture of you looking at the videos and taking notes, and then I also had a control group that was a correspondence group. So if we say 1985 as a beginning of technology, at least as we came to know it because of the Apple IIe, even though there were Apple IIe first, um, even though there was lots of technology going on, that was the first time that a lot of people had the opportunity to really access it. What else do you remember in terms of technology? That's influenced you. So the boomers first, and then Xers to get the ones that these period people haven't experienced. Punch cards. Okay, punch cards. Who said that? Okay, and what? You never had to do that before because you sign in. Uh, no, no, that was the first. Oh, the time experience. when you had to go. Yeah, you had to have these little cards. And you had to go to this little place and stand in line and. Politely give your cards to somebody and then stand around waiting for your output, which maybe an hour, but overnight. Yeah. Overnight, yeah. Okay. What else do you remember about technology? Because this is our lived experience. Game oh yeah, game consoles. You were the queen of those, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Game consoles. Atari. Yeah, Atari and Pac-Man. And everything was just digital. Got letters, numbers, green. 
Yeah. It's that green spider. Uh -huh. I remember giant satellite dishes. If you were, if you had a lot of money, uh -huh. like some of my mom's friends did, they had a satellite dish that was huge out in the backyard. They had to shut down their pool so they could have this thing. Yeah. And they had all these channels, like 200 channels <laughs> on TV. <laughs> they could watch all the time. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> A number of things have changed. You know, I can't. One of the things that I remember first was your, and this is, I guess I should go here first. Um, <laughs> 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 you remember, I think there's a big jump. There's a big jump between these two, but do you remember when we got this all in one phone? And it could have been any number of different phones. I was expecting you guys to talk about telephones, because telephones really have changed. And I told Colleen that we were going to talk about this, but, but Colleen, um, how old are you? 29. I know that. I'm remote. Uh, <laughs> and when, when she was young, maybe three, four, we'd be riding around in the car, and we would sometimes see these people that had these gigantic phones. They were the biggest things. They had a big radio and they had a big uh, antenna. So Colleen and I, her mother started it before she played right along with it, we used to carry her big phone around between me and uh, in the front seat now. And, and every time we'd see one of those people who always looked so self-important talking, we would, uh, we would pick up the pink phone and go, hello, that's for you. <laughs> you know, I remember that so clearly. Our phones were so large. And then they got smaller. They went different ways. Some of them opened up. You had a little keyboard there. Others uh, were long and had a nice antenna, fit in your pocket. And what was so impressive about that was that there was a point in which with phones, first a phone was a phone. Then a phone became something else. I don't, I, as I recall, you could put your schedule on it. That was the first thing. And I remember um, before that happened, I had a little Palm Pilot that I would put on my uh, dates in and stuff, and I went to a conference, and the uh, guy that I was working with said, uh, who was speaking, he said, in a matter of two or three years, telephones will have your schedulers in, in there, and you'll be able to connect to the internet, <coughs> and play games, and listen to music, and everybody but no! <laughs> I couldn't imagine that. Well, of course, we've seen a tremendous evolution since then. Uh, to the point that we probably could not live without our iPhones or our smartphones, certainly. What has that done to us? Disengaged. Yeah, it's disengaged us. We have a joke, Dean and I, that um, it's great in situations where somebody's asking for a handout get out of your phone and pretend like you're really busy. <laughs> and they don't ask. But <laughs> um, generally, it's disengaged us because we're always looking at the phone. And I used to, those of you who go back a while, I used to say, when I would talk about change, I used to talk about how when they're only these large cell phones, and then gradually they became smaller and smaller and people acquired them. And then over time, people, everybody had them. And everybody had a personal computer as well. And what it's done for us, as we've already said, is that it makes us uh, disengage. And what I would like to ask is, I hope I get the right one. Yeah, there we go. This is what I'm not good at. The students still say to me, Dr. Kelly, if you could just be a little bit quicker on those, uh, on those links. We opened these rubber, but I don't know where they went. Here somewhere. 
<laughs> you have tabs open too. Yeah. Oh. Can I go here? Talk someone to talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Down to 
they remember 90% of what they do. So when we think about what we try to do in education, we spend a lot of time, I think, defining, listing, describing, and explaining, doing some demonstrating and applying, but we often do not get to the analysis, the definition, the creation, the evaluation of why are we doing this, and is this a good thing to do? I had a, an encounter earlier today with a fifth grader who was having to practice his cursing. He's in fifth grade, and he has to pick practice cursive. How often do you use cursive? Remember, that's writing, yeah, right? <laughs> you know, I sign, when I don't electronically sign, of course I sign my name. I write notes to people, and people, anybody who's ever worked for me knows that my note, my scribbling is very hard to read. Mm -hmm. But you get the, the point, is that we don't do cursive very much anymore. And maybe it's important to a certain extent, but what is it replacing? So if we think about what we do in education for a minute, how we teach, how we learn best, it's the exact reverse of what we actually do in education. And yet the technology that exists is, I would say, we're capable of doing much more with the technology if we let go of some of the control of feeling like this is how you learn a subject, this is what you have to do first. I mean, I've long ago given up the idea that I know everything. But of course, when you get a PhD, you know you know nothing. <laughs> and you know you work very hard on the graduate faculty are telling you that you know nothing, and you now know that you know nothing. <laughs> and therefore, you should be humble about what is known for the rest of your life, that you only know a certain amount, and you've been in a very specialized field. So what I I've always said to myself, you know what, a lot of the stuff I can look up, I don't really have to know this right now. But it would be good um, if I knew where I could locate it and I knew what a credible source was. So let's think about uh, how technology has changed how we work and how we work in education. So the very first thing that I'll say is that technology has taken the place of human beings. There are many things, and many things that are probably glad we don't have to do anymore because they're very routinized tasks. And that's why you have to have an advanced education because many of the things that are required for you to do require technical training, not a college education, but technical training, uh, so that you can learn those specialized things that you need to do with computers, et cetera. But it's taken the place of many human beings. And most critically, I think it's taken the place of much human interaction. And there are people in this room who know that I'll send you a little message even though you're two doors down from me. <coughs> Liz, isn't that right? Okay. Send her a little message and say, do you know about this, or Angela? Uh, which is convenient because you don't have to get out of your chair, but it doesn't promote face-to-face -face interaction. We're constantly involved with our technology, and perhaps less so with our students or with our, our family members. Uh, I know that uh, when I go out to eat, I, it drives me crazy when I see people sitting at, at a table looking at their technology and not talking to each other. Uh, we have a rule about that. We don't usually do it very often. We ask for permission. We may, we may look at this for a minute because you have to find something out. But when you have technology in your work life as an educator or as a learner or both, you're constantly in work mode. You're constantly thinking about, has somebody emailed me that I need to respond to right away? Is there a client that's there? I, I know that I live and die by all those crazy emails that I get all the time that I, I need to tell people this and that. We're constantly in that work mode. And I looked up the research on this, and it says that once you work, that 40 hours is a good amount for people to work. And when you start working overtime, 60 hours, 80 hours, 90 hours a week, it works for about a two-week period, and then you can't get any more done than you would get done in a 40-hour week. It's because you're so depleted of that sensible thinking through things. We once had an administrator far before you, Jenna, that um, wanted an instant answer on everything. And I would say, I have to think about this. I can't tell you instantly what this is. And yet I've seen over time, and it wasn't you, Stephen, either. And so, um, but 
over time, we have seen people move very quickly to making a decision extremely fast. Get the first three source, use the first three sources you find online, slap them into the paper, wrap the introduction and the conclusion around it, provide some support, and just ship it out. Because I'd rather be on a social network or in college, I know you'd rather be playing. I know that. Um, which is why we shouldn't have you come to college right directly unless you're very academically oriented because you should have a year to look out around and see what the rest of the world is doing and see that it isn't as, as nice as you think it is. Or people out there who are struggling. There are a lot of things that need to be fixed uh, and it's going to take your advanced education to do that. Um, but what we've seen with technology is it facilitates multitasking. And for years, that same person said, you should be able to multitask. And I learned to say, you shouldn't should I? Because it breaks your train of thought. It's difficult to multitask. Some people do it better than others. I am pretty sure I'm quite ADD as a result of it. I don't know whether I was previously or not. Because always the things are going off. I'm looking at my email. I'm looking at uh, any text that somebody sends me. I'm answering the phone. I'm doing whatever I was actually doing, people are coming to the door, but we're all pushing ourselves in many different directions. And among students, I see the inability to concentrate on one thing, the ability to do anything at any depth. And yet, uh, we teach the same way we used to teach. You've got to require all these facts. You have to sit and listen to me. I've seen three or four of you already falling asleep. You don't learn that way. You learn when you're active, when your brain is engaged, and when you are um, fully present to whatever uh, exercise, whatever it is that is being done. Uh, did you know that uh, thinking span in, in adolescents and uh, young adults and has attention span has decreased from 14 seconds to 9 seconds because they think they're all because of the use of all the technology. So. Early adolescents, young adults, uh, could pay attention to something for 14 seconds, and then it used to be. And now it's down to nine seconds, which is the same as the attention span of a goldfish. <laughs> um, so it's reduced thinking time. And the one thing that I found out is that if you work very hard for a long time, it blows out your adrenal glands, which are part of the mechanism which help you absorb stress. So when I started having all of my physical problems, and of course they started looking at my, my whole system, and again and again, people said, you have no ability to absorb stress. So this is, to, is harder on you than it might be on other people because you have nowhere to go with it. There's no body function that can say, okay, just hold on, you'll be all right, this will pass, but you're not getting any pass. Usually your adrenal glands recycle themselves when you're sleeping. Where else do you know? I mean, from exercise to get that to me to bring it up. Yeah, okay. Um, so, no, so because we're doing all this multitasking, um, and, well, we, uh, it makes it more difficult for us to cope with stress. And so we are forced to rely on information that's easiest to get. Now, I know there are many of you that I'm speaking to a scholarly group who wouldn't do that, wouldn't get the first three references and slap together. But in my experience in education, there's probably two, maybe, maybe this is too hard. I'm looking at all the ones that don't do this that are out in the audience because I know you can be the really good students. Um, but most people that I've encountered, most college students, don't go deep. They go efficiently. Put a few things together, hope it's the best, it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. Unaccustomed to criticism because in many cases our classes are way too large to provide any criticism. So my take on this is that education hasn't really changed as much as it could in light of what we know about how people learn. So we still teach by lectures. 
we, to some extent, uh, certainly provide uh, in-person experience when we can. Um, but college faculty and uh, secondary students, how much uh, in-service or professional development do you get about how to use technology to bring the classroom, uh, bring the real, bring the real world, but real world into your classroom? Not very much. And if you do, it's one of those uh, four hours, we're going to tell you about it, show you about it, and you know that you won't get that equipment for six years, seven years, and then it'll be outdated, and you'll figure out what, how you have to do it, unless you're very, very lucky with grants or whatever, and you get uh, technology when, they, when it's needed. And yet, young people have access to the whole world through their smartphones, and they use them in many ways that we would maybe think is are counterproductive, but they could learn how to use them in a way that would be uh, would be helpful in terms of critically thinking about the world, finding information. I always love it when somebody in my class where I'll say, well, I think it's about this much percentage. Mm -hmm. And someone will look it up right there and say, well, actually, it's this much, and which I appreciate. So because uh, people aren't really engaged. They don't usually do their homework. They don't do their work. Alexander, was it 53 or 54 percent of the people in our, our flipped adolescence class who never came to class prepared? Never. So they depended on me telling them what was important, and then they depended on me giving them a very detailed review sheet so they could look at everything, memorize it, and be ready for the exam, and then spit it out and never remember it again. And I would say to them, you make me nervous. I'm getting old. <laughs> Suppose you have to take care of me in my elder years. And I see you. And I look up and I see you. And I still have enough brain to remember that you were the one that never did the work. <laughs> Give me somebody else. <laughs> so I really have felt strongly that we have to find different ways to engage people. Because telling them, talking to them exactly what I'm doing is not really fitting the bill. So again, what kind of learning opportunities do we provide? Anybody have anything to add to what we do in secondary classrooms? Because I know that's where some of you have come from. Or what we do in college classrooms. You got anything, Jim? Small group discussion, big share pair, yep. all, all, the, all the trendy buzzwords that we have now. Oh. Hey, that's why we're learning. You can't tell me that's trendy. I've been teaching that for years. But sharing with each other, discussing things, certainly we have that. So I think that we could do a lot better at teaching, and we could do a lot better at helping people to learn powerfully and to the point that they know how to find information when they don't know what um, a particular part of information that needs to be known, but that they can they know how to reason. They can weigh information. They can know what is true. Yesterday I was sitting next to somebody who was telling the person that uh, was sitting next to me that who she was going to vote, vote for. And she was talking about how important this candidate was and what I had to say, and it was not the candidate I support. But, uh, no surprise, but there was a big discussion there, and I'm thinking, where do you get your facts from? I'm thinking, this person, I don't know whether I want to deter her it was inappropriate to do so, but I was going to turn her and say, How do you, where do you know that from? But then she revealed herself and she said, I saw that on TV. And I thought, oh yeah, that's a great source of information. It may pique your curiosity, but you have to learn to interact with the TV and the information and, and say, yes, yeah, so you all always know that, haven't you, Miss Colleen? Her mother always yells at the TV. That's not true! She's lying! <laughs> but anyway, so I think that we need to be much more interactive with people. Um, and education has to really change. In fact, when I used to teach about the future of education when I was at the University of Wisconsin before I came here, I really didn't expect that anybody would come and sit in a classroom two or three times a week and be taught by the sage on stage. Never imagined that that would happen. I feel like we need to make people more responsible for their learning. They get more engaged when you do that. Um, but we have to make money at the university. And increasingly in Arizona, it's the undergraduates who are paying. 
the tuition. So what I wanted to tell you just quickly about, there's a few people that I know are either in the audience or, uh, or in the remote audience, and how I tried to do this over time. When I was at Plattsburgh State many years ago, that's a new part of the SUNY New York system, I came on the idea of peer teaching. So I was able to get undergraduates who had taken a particular course that I had done, had taught to provide additional ideas, additional ways to engage people. So this is a shout out to Barbara uh, Perry Lyon, because she was one of my first peer teachers. I've also spent time in classrooms where, as a teacher educator in the Family and Consumer Sciences Education Program, uh, we were training teachers. And there's a number of them here who, I don't know if any of them are still working. I think they're all retired. They beat me to it. But um, we spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time in classrooms. And when I taught the adolescence class, I had the great opportunity to work with Teresa McDonald in a middle school here in town, where we spent time looking at what adult, young adolescents do, and we became, this is very quaint, became pen pals with them. Remember when we used to write a whole letter to people? We would talk about what it was like. And of course, over time, I worked in a number of other people's classrooms where they learned how to teach by observing you and by working side to side with them. See them by Noah Vera and Virginia and um, a number of you that I've worked with. But I want to give a shout out to, to Therese. Don and Dan, can you take that? Okay. Or your wife, or anything, uh, who also helped me. I also want to give a shout out to when you work with teachers, they have lots of great teaching information. And um, this was an opportunity. We did a child development a teaching strategy a couple years ago. Um, and these are some of the people that helped us with that. And there you are, Michelle. I see you there. And there you are, Carol. I see you there. This is, this must be Johnny, right? Huh? Because this is Colleen right here. Yeah. <laughs> and we had all these kids running around and doing things as well. But um, so we were living our real life and then sharing some of our professional life. This was a little hard to see. Um, let's see now, what was it I had to do to make it? Uh-oh. Well, I was going to make it darker, but I forgot how to do it. Robert. My mother always said that I'd never get through life unless I had this system. <laughs> That's you too. So uh, here's, this is why I said something about corporate learning, because for years uh, I had teacher institutes, actually Von Prof funded these for a number of years when he was the director of, uh, uh, what was it? Career and technical education then? Or was it we had a lot of names at that time. Yeah, we had a lot of names. <laughs> but uh, this is a group of teachers who were, uh, we learned about corporate learning and then we developed lesson plans around it. So there you are, Lynn Blankenship. I saw you come in uh, teaching us about corporate learning. And there's Kathy Bush, who is also here, who was, you were on the teaching team, you were on the side of the teachers. So we spent a lot of time trying to make education more real to students, and some of that has happened through graduate students that I've worked with. There you are again, Carol, and there you are, Michelle. I have many pictures of Michelle that I couldn't use, but I have. And then somebody else who, uh, Wilma Sarush, who actually is a, I think she's still principal of a charter school here in town that's been quite successful. Um, and over time, we too have changed our names many times. Uh, we used to call it life management, and then we became family consumer sciences education, which I believe it still is, and these are some of the people that have influenced uh, young people in secondary schools over the years. So some of these people are, oh, well, let's see, Larry, you're always have to get in the back, but you're there. And of course, this is Dr. Noor. I almost put in the slide Dr. Noor of you with the balloon hat on. Remember that? We had balloon hats that were a very silly group. Anyway. Um, over time, I recognize that I've worked with a number of family and consumer science teachers, and I've had the great pleasure of seeing them be successful, selected as outstanding teachers, seeing their students uh, with national awards. Um, I think that's probably been my greatest success. I think some of the teaching that I've done here in large classrooms, probably a little bit less so, but I've felt wonderful relationships with people. 
Oh, Emily, I forgot you. Um, there's a couple other people in here that I thought might be here. It's another Larry Pike <coughs> in your classroom. I think this is where we're learning about culinary arts down at Nogales uh, High School, and where his students had a restaurant. And his students paired up with us and explained to us what they were doing and how, how they were preparing uh, their particular uh, meal and um, what they had learned, how, how they knew the various uh, competencies that they were supposed to have in culinary arts at the secondary level. And I was going to come back and have lunch. Everybody else had other things to do. So what I wanted to have us think about is how should education change? I've given you some indications of what I think should happen, but I have some for family studies. That's the part of the now for those of you. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm nervous, I push things all, all professors need uh, somebody that is technologically sad to be in the That is so true. Thank you for being so generous and related to so, Let's think about. So, in family studies, which is my department, we. We say we study people, family studies and human development, and the popular way of saying it is that we study people from womb to tomb, and we study all of their relationships over time. And so our hope is to, of course, first um, engage in the scholarly literature, discover new knowledge, learn ways to apply that knowledge. But the great basis of what we do is the undergraduate program, because we have many more undergraduates. So to support its graduate students. We have like 500 something, around 450, 500 mm -hmm. uh, undergraduates every four years or so. So my proposal is that we should do different things in the undergraduate experience. And it has troubled me for a long time that we are not helping undergraduates to develop a sense of social justice and empowering them to look at current conditions and figure out how we can apply the literature to, to that and how we can uh, have more opportunities for our students in, in real life situations that they can then learn the mechanisms of change and apply those. So it's really bothered me for a long time that we don't have this focus on one of the greatest uh, problems I think of our time, which is poverty. Certainly here in Tucson, and in Arizona, we're in one of the poorest states in the United States, and uh, Tucson's, gosh, I have to think about this for a minute, but I think that it's one in every five children grows up in poverty in, here, in uh, Tucson. One in every four. And if every four, it's worse. So how do we help them? How do we help undergraduates to not get their degree and go off benignly into their, uh, to their happy middle class lives? And never really, not all of the people who come from the middle class, I realize, but uh, I think that we ought to be doing more to try to get undergraduates to uh, recognize what the problems are and know how to make them, uh, know how to start to change them. And I think that people, undergraduates, should have a, a sense of how to listen to people who are running for office and to recognize that a view of the world can be presented, and many different uh, views of the world certainly exist, but upon what basis are they acquired, and how, how does that benefit us all? How do we change the world? How do we make it better? Growing up, my dad always said, always leave things better than you found them. So he became a much sought after guest because he always fixed things that we didn't know. <laughs> One of those things. And my mother used to always say, always be nice to people, always thank them uh, for their hospitality or whatever they've given us. So I've thanked a million times and I've tried over time to work to make change. But I feel, as, as a baby boomer, um, leaving teaching, I feel like there's a lot more change that could have been made in the world, and I feel like we've progressed tremendously on the changes that we have made um, over time. And I think that it's important that we provide to uh, 
our students, our family study students, they care about families, they care about individuals. They know the research well, but they need to know how to engage in the community and make the difference. It bothers me that that is not the case. Um, it seems like we're always worried about covering the content as opposed to um, providing more of a uh, em emphasis on what you do with the content to better mankind. So some of the things that I'd like to suggest, uh, oh, you know, you're going to have this one do it. Um, I would like to say I think that we should have more focus on social justice. It should be heavily field-based, which is not very glamorous, and it's time-consuming for research-oriented faculty who have other responsibilities. Um, here's the one that I really noticed is when I used to teach in my adolescence class, um, we would talk about what motivates you to learn. We would talk about intrinsic motivation, and we would talk about extrinsic motivation, among other things. And one of the things that always seemed to be the case was more people were extrinsically motivated than intrinsically motivated. They were learning just to learn. They were learning because it would get them a better job, that they needed to take this course for a degree. And some people, because when they got a good grade, they felt a sense of accomplishment. And so that was the grade that was the extrinsic part. But over time, I, I brought that one. That was no problem. And because Usually, when you achieve at a high level, after a while, it becomes important to you to, as to how you learn and the fact that you need to continue learning. So one of the things that has really troubled me is that I don't see in the current um, group of students, I see it in one third of you who are out there. But I see, and I, I think the middle third probably could be influenced, but I see at least a third of our students, and judging by 54% not coming to class prepared, maybe it's more, who only do things when they have to do them, and they're going to get points for them, or they're going to, uh, well, they're going to get points for them, and when there's some reason that they have to do things. And most people I have found, I think they're very motivated by getting the degree and moving on because it's the ticket to a better life. And we all know that education can make a huge difference in people, people's lives. But, oh, I used huge. I'm sorry for those of you who are in my 301 class. Too big. Um, but I, I, I think that intrinsic rewards would be a much better way to turn. I think that, that helping people, uh, learning information for the sake of learning information, feeling some joy and some power in what you know and how to share it, and I would like people to have high ideals. I think this generation, millennials, have that. They do have high ideals. And they don't think they have high standards, many of them. Not all of them, but many of them. And I'd like to really see some focus on the relationship of public service to the quality of life for all. I'd like to see, and our current president really wants to see, that we have 100% engagement. So that means that everybody who graduates from the University of Arizona will have been in some sort of a public or professional service role where they'll work with real people and see um, how their particular discipline can affect change. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it also has to do with public service in, in general. So well, how do you do that? So one of the ways that you do that, in my opinion, now this is part of the commercial message, you don't want to agree with me, but I'm going to defer to my favorite, one of my favorite uh, elected officials. The people in Washington, too many of the people in Washington, do not represent the folks who elected them. They represent the rich and the powerful, who don't want their taxes raised, who don't want to see and change. We're perfectly happy with things where they're indeed they're doing great with things where they are. And they stay in the ear of enough of the folks in Washington that it has made it almost impossible to get any kind of change. The only way we get change is when enough people in this country say, I'm bad as hell and I'm fed up and I'm not going to do this anymore. You are not going to go back and represent me in Washington, D.C. if you are not willing to pass a meaningful infrastructure bill. 
if you are not willing to refinance student loan interest rates and stop dragging in billions of dollars in profits off the backs of kids who otherwise can't afford to go to college. If you don't say you're going to fund the NIH and the NISF because that is our future. We have to make these issues salient and not just wonky. When you hear us talk about this and you say, this is like the wonkiest conference ever. Can you imagine saying that at a tech conference? When you say this is the wonkiest conference we've ever had, no, these have to be the things that you wake up people all over America and say, what matters? For whether or not you're going to have a job, whether or not you're going to have a retirement, whether or not your kids are going to have any chance to build a future for them, it's got to be about these core issues. And we got to talk about them, talk about them enough until there's some real change in this country. That's all I know to do. <laughs>